Hello, I'm Keith Robinson and I'm going to share with you my research into Sir Robert Hart, the musician. Not surprisingly, most studies of Robert Hart's extraordinary career in China are concerned with his work in the Maritime Customs Service and his role in the politics of the time. In the background, however, is an underlying thread of musical activity. I will try and show how his musical ideas were influenced by the times he lived in, but also how he influenced Western people's understanding of Chinese music, how he influenced Chinese people's understanding of Western classical and popular music. There are aspects to Hart's musical life that are really interesting, and I will look at where did Hart get his musical training, what makes Hart special and unusual is the support he gives to his staff to study Chinese culture, brass bands in China, Hart's string band and Hart's attempts at composition. Where did Hart get his musical training? We've no evidence that Hart had any lessons on the cornet or the violin, but we do know that by 1880 he had a cello and was teaching himself how to play it. We have to assume that he was also self-taught on the violin. In England in the 18th century, the academic study of music was acceptable, but to be a professional musician was thought to be a socially inferior career. However, all that began to change in the beginning of the 19th century with the publication of tutor books, mostly by foreign musicians, that for the first time dealt in detail with advanced playing techniques on the violin and most other instruments. <clears throat> what is interesting about Hart is the amount of music he bought, its diversity and how he practiced music regularly. He is no longer an amateur content with a mediocre technique. He is determined to play well. On the other hand, he is not intent on becoming a professional musician. This is a list of music that Hart bought in 1874. All the black um, entries are what he bought. And I've put in red where these composers are known to have published influential tutor books. Uh, so you can see Allard in 1844 published his complete progressive method on the violin. Uh, Paganini, God Save the Queen. Uh, Nicholas Boscher was a um, professor of harp at the Royal Academy of Music. Um, Clemente, very influential piano uh, tutor. Dankler, another compo uh, composer who wrote an important violin method. Uh, and then you get uh, people like Muller. Now, I'm not saying Hart bought Muller's clarinet method, but he certainly bought some of Muller's music. And it shows that Hart was really up to date with what was being published and how uh, extensive this publishing was and how it changed how people learned to play music. And even with the brass band, he subscribes to all the important brass journals and he's remarkably well informed about what publications are available for brass band. How did Hart become interested in brass bands if he didn't play? Well, it's a really good question. We don't really know the answer. But um, I think that he was influenced by the Distin family. It is possible that he heard concerts by the Distin family. We have no evidence to say that Hart ever went to any of their concerts, but they are known to have given concerts in the vicinities that Hart frequented as a youth. They were sensational players of brass instruments, and some historians credit them with the establishment in Britain of the brass band movement. And these are from Farr's book on Distin. And you can see um, they do a concert in Londonderry, Belfast, Dublin, and so on. Now, Hart was very bright, <clears throat> an intelligent boy, so it might seem strange to be suggesting that in 1843, when he was eight years old, 
perhaps the seeds of his love of the brass band were sown. But it has to be seen in the context that at 10 years old, his father sent him to school in England. And at 15 years old, he entered Queen's University on a scholarship. What makes Hart special and unusual is the support he gives to his staff to study Chinese culture. And <clears throat> I want to uh, talk about George Carter Stent, 1833-1884. Stent is asked to work with the Maritimes Customs Service because of his skill with learning the Chinese language and his work on a Chinese dictionary. Um, but in 1872, he published his Dame Wang songs. And this is an impassioned plea to listen to Chinese folk songs because they deal with the everyday situations and emotions that English people deal with and are therefore capable of communicating across the language barrier with people who don't speak Chinese. And Stent published the melody in Western notation, of which there's a copy there, and he also published the words. <clears throat> and I think this idea um, of how the ordinary music, folk music of China, could communicate with people was really influential with art. And when you look at the 1884 exhibition catalogue, uh, you can see uh, the influence of Stent both in how the music is presented in the catalogue and Hart's ambition to send over these musicians to play in London. Um, I've composed a piano accompaniment and translated the words into simplified Chinese. I think two things hold back performances of traditional Chinese folk songs in today's concert halls. Often they have no piano accompaniment and today people don't read traditional Chinese very easily. So I've given them piano accompaniments but I've tried to avoid Western harmony and aim for a more sympathetic Chinese style and I've translated them into simplified Chinese. And um, uh, this is a recording with um, T... Uh, um, T... What? Oh God, sorry. Tan Shi Rui um, of Dame Wang Song. Just an extract. I think it's really strange we can go to a recital and hear songs in German and French but I very well I don't think I've ever been to a song recital and heard a traditional Chinese song sung in Chinese so I'm hoping that we can change that. Um, Stent also published in 1874 20 poems in English and Stent said these were translations of Chinese folk songs. Most people have thought that he just made the poems up but I think he could be telling the truth because there's no evidence that he wrote original poems and so I have set Entombed Alive 
um, to music. Um, these are early examples of translations into English of Chinese poems. Um, the singer here is Emma Morley. Um, I'm just going to give you an extract of the first verse and I think the fourth verse. Um, but I hope in the future to try and discover what the original Chinese songs were and um, link them to them. And I'd like to move on to Anton Beagle, 1846-1891. Beagle started to teach the Beiyang Naval Band in 1881. And we know from a programme the band played in Shanghai, October the 24th, 1883, that it included items that were traditional Chinese folk songs. And these seem to be the earliest examples of Chinese tunes arranged for brass band. One of the tunes was Mama Nihao Ho Tu, Chinese March, by Beagle. Beagle became Hart's bandmaster, and we know from a newspaper report on the 21st of July 1888 in the North China Herald that Hart's band played at a private party and that they played Chinese music. And so um, I've done a computer realization on of of how uh, this mama nihao might sound um with, with arranged for brass band <laughs>
Um, most interesting is that in 1898, Li Yingung was appointed musical director of Yuan Shikai's military band, and he published his book, Military Music. He was determined to use traditional tunes with the band, and one group of instrumental pieces he specifically states should be played on Western instruments. Um, so, I think I've got... So, um, this is the start of, I think, five pieces that Lee um, suggests should be played on military band. And uh, so what I've done is the computer realisation of what these might sound like. Um, and I've linked them all together, uh, one after the other, um, because I think there is some evidence that they could be played as a suite. Um, so um, here is... Uh, Oh, sorry. Wrong one. <laughs> oh yeah, here we go. Again, it's an audio computer uh, computer realization. Uh, so you get some idea um, of um, how it might have, well, my interpretation of how it might have sounded. I think it's interesting uh, because he's one of the few co composers uh, from this time. Um, his book, Military Music, um, is uh, one of the few examples that we've got that we know what kind of music was being played by early Yuen Shikai bands. Um, and it's an example um, of brass bands playing traditional Chinese tunes, uh, which is what Hart was doing as well. Uh, now I'm going to move on to brass bands in China. And um, the earliest brass bands in China were introduced by the French Jesuits. And this is a photograph sometime between 1858 and 1870 of uh, musicians. And you can see they're actually reading music. So they're playing uh, from written music. Um, the Jesuits were really, really important. And yet uh, we know very little about their teaching methods uh, or their teaching material. But um, you can see... This is the uh, Xu Jiahui band in 1864. 
which is early um, but you can see that they must have um, invested a lot of money in buying instruments because they seem to have had quite a lot of brass bands um, and I think the Xu uh, uh music is really really important um, I, I can't go into it now but I do think um, it, it really needs more research um, this is Hearts Band um, early picture of Hearts Band practicing in the garden and this is um, from 1880 sorry 1889 um, after the Boxer Revolution uh, you can see pictures of the band in 1906 and it's a much bigger band um, here we go this is 1906 and the other thing that the Jesuits did which I think is really interesting is that they um, sorry, um, incorporated traditional music uh, Chinese traditional instruments and music into the services um, which I think is really interesting um, and not something that's often discussed and again we don't know what the Jesuits taught um, very much so there's plenty of research could be done in that and uh, now I'm going to talk about Hart's string band um, Um, in 1890 Hart writes to Campbell to send him two violins and two violas because he hopes in six months to have founded by my own teaching and for my own amusement a string quartet. Uh, there are no photographs of the string band however I think it is in fact very important in the development of the Chinese symphonic orchestra. All accounts suggest the string band played extremely well and that must have been a result of Nkanakao's gifted ability to teach as well as Hart's own experience and knowledge of the literature available on string instruments to achieve the best results in the shortest possible time. Hart is ahead of his time in teaching Chinese musicians Western orchestral instruments. There's a curious link in that Xiao Mei went to study in Germany at Leipzig University with Dora Vol von Mullendorf and in 1916 published the first string quartet by a Chinese composer and he dedicated it to Dora. Dora was the daughter of Paul Mullendorf, Hart's friend, and we know that when Paul died Hart paid for Dora to continue to have violin lessons. Xiao Yongmei returned to Beijing and set up the first Chinese symphony orchestra and recruited some of his players from musicians who'd been in Hart's band. So this screenshot, we know uh, who was in Hart's band in 1906 and we know who was in Xiao Yongmei's orchestra. Nine of those musicians came from Hart's band. Now, the really interesting one is the clarinetist Mu Jiu Ching because Shuang Ju has written a very interesting paper about Mu Jiu Ching and what is interesting is to read how Mu Jiu Ching's teaching is assessed by the pupils that he dealt with. Um, he asked his students to acquire profound performance technique and pay attention to fundamentals. Instead of adhering to rigid procedure he made flexible learning arrangements according to the learning processes of different students in order to help them fully understand and learn. The prominent features of his students playing were that they had solid fundamentals and excellent technique and could easily play a repertoire of different styles and difficulty levels. Mu believed that music expression 
is as important as fundamentals, and the two are indivisible. He stressed that technique is best is the basis of musicianship, and musical expression is what makes the technique come into practice. Thus, Mu always required his students to master performance technique, cultivate music appreciation, develop musicianship, and most of all, balance all these aspects. Mu had responsibilities in his teaching as well as love and care for his students. He cared for their life and dreams and provided them financial help even when Mu was not himself well off himself. I think this is a powerful endorsement of the way Hart and Enkanako taught their students. Not uh, uh, no, not only easily play repertoire of different styles and difficulties and difficult levels, but also require the students to master performance technique, cultivate musical appreciation, develop musicianship, and most of all, balance all these aspects. Um, Moody Ching's pupil talked about learning the Brahms clarinet sonata with him. And you can't imagine where Mu Ju Ching could have acquired that music other than through Robert Hart. Um, so I think the string orchestra has been rather neglected, but I think actually it will turn out to be a really important link to um, Western uh, Chinese symphony orchestra. Um, and it's it's kind of ironic of that uh, Asia, most of the music, Western musical instruments are made in Asia, in China and Japan. Um, most Chinese cities and Japanese cities have a symphony orchestra. And although Western history of music is very narrow from like Vivaldi to Shostakovich, um, the actual composers played and the music performed is extremely narrow uh, and yet it seems to have captured the Chinese imagination so much uh, and I wonder why. Um, so um, I just want to move on to composition. Uh, this is the most interesting aspect of art, the musician, because he clearly has no training in composition, but is determined to publish some of his works. Sadly, I have not been able to find any examples uh, of his compositions, but the point is he chose to ask for help from women composers. This was a time when women could rarely have tuition in composition, and even if they did publish work, it was very difficult to get performances. And I want to draw your attention to Bessie Levesque. This is a picture of her in 1877. She was married to an accountant that worked for the Maritime Customs Service. Um, in 1873, you get a letter uh, in which Hart says, I want, he's writing to Campbell, I want to talk about his music. I've written 10 songs. The words and airs are my own. I've also written 10 pieces for violin. Mm, by 1883, he's still talking about composition and he mentions Mrs. Perkis. This is Bessie Levesque's married name and she's playing piano in his weekly ensembles. And then in September 1883, he writes to Campbell again. What is the cost of publishing music in London in good style? How much per page? Per hundred, five hundred, thousand copies? Uh, we know that Mrs. Perkis, Bessie Levesque, did publish songs because several of her compositions are held in the British Library. She must have been one of the first women to have her songs published because over the, over the Ocean World, a ballad was published in 1860. That's really early. Um, she appears in the Musical Times and Singing Class Circular of 1869 uh, with her piece, How Beautiful is the Sunshine, Serenade from the Spanish, composed by Bessie Levesque. And there's an example of her music. It gets a pretty harsh review. 
But actually, I think it's quite a reasonable piece. Now, Hart also asks Campbell's wife if she would help him write piano accompaniments. We know that Mrs Campbell was an excellent pianist and she studied with Dr Wilde. It is possible that he taught her harmony and composition because in 1877 he published Modern Counterpoint in major and minor keys by Henry Wilde, principal of the London Academy of Music. It was an attempt to teach the principles of counterpoint taken from examples of the masters and make it relevant to what was being written at the time. Interestingly, the publishers were Hutchings and Roma, and that's the same publishers that Hart was inquiring about whether he could get his music published. And again, you see this link with public uh, people publishing books to help with composition. Um, so maybe Mrs. Campbell had had lessons with Wilde. Although Hart does not seem to have asked Charlotte Devira. Uh, and she was the wife of Jean Gabriel de Vera. Um, he was the diplomat and translator. Um, but she was a talented musician and composer. And he doesn't seem to have asked her for help in composing. But she published six preludes for piano in 1877 and several songs. And the most interesting are 20 melodies for singing and piano published in 1889. Four of these use popular Chinese Beijing folk songs. Um, some of them had been published earlier, and these were what they were. And this is Chanson Picanese, the start of it. So that concludes my introduction to Robert Hart, the musician. Um, the, I haven't time to talk about. Uh, there are lots of programs and uh, it's interesting to see the range and repertoire that his band played um, from the programs. Uh, but anyway, I hope you've enjoyed that. Um, thank you very much for listening and thanks for uh, allowing me to present my research.